But let's jump into GraphQL. And we've ultimately learned thus far that GraphQL is a modern approach to designing APIs, and it addresses many of the limitations of a traditional REST API. So with GraphQL, we're going to see how this really is, is well suited for applications with complex data requirements and dynamic user interfaces. Um, just taking a look at the available endpoint here, GraphQL, unlike REST, uh, which has multiple different endpoints, as we've seen with, with the Spotify API, you know, GraphQL typically exposes a single endpoint. This means the clients are going to send their queries to this endpoint, specifying the data that they need, and they'll receive a response that's tailored to their request. In addition to just making a request to a singular endpoint, GraphQL consists of two different functions. These are queries and mutations. So with the flexible queries, you know, a client is going to define their data requirements with the query language, well, obviously called GraphQL. Uh, but this is going to allow clients to request a specific field from many different resources within a single query. This is going to help to eliminate overfetching, so receiving more data than we need, as we saw with our initial request to Spotify. And it's also going to help to eliminate underfetching which is not receiving enough information. As we saw again with Spotify, they have 61 different endpoints that we can hit, and we may need data, uh, data from various endpoints to fulfill our application's requirements. So we're gonna see that here in just a second. Uh, Jesse mentioned you know, use of a strongly typed schema. That schema is gonna explicitly outline the types of data that can be queried and the relationships between them really serves as you know, a contract between clients and servers, ensuring that both parties understand the data structure. With that data structure, typically we see in a GraphQL um, breakdown that data is nested and hierarchical, meaning that we can really efficiently make requests and retrieve related data, again, without making many different round trips. We just target the specific level of that hierarchy that we need, outline which elements of that uh, layer uh, we, we truly need again. So what happens when we make a request to an endpoint using GraphQL? Ultimately, behind the scenes, there is what is called a resolver. This resolver is just a function and it is what is responsible for functioning and actually pulling the data when we make a request. These resolvers allow developers to control you know, how the data is fetched, how it's manipulated, and ultimately transformed before it's being sent back to the client. So let's jump in. We'll take a look at this GraphQL API. We are currently interacting with a country's GraphQL API. And we're mostly just going to be making queries here today. So the queries that we have available to us would be to fetch continent information, countries, uh, a specific country, languages, and then a specific language. So starting things off, we can pop open our continents request. And this is a general query to this API. We can see the top level of this hierarchy is the continents uh, layer. Within that continents layer, we're gonna find data pertaining to the continent code, the name. We can access countries within that continent, additional information on the countries themselves, what currencies are used as well, languages and so on and so forth. So we can make this request and as you see, we can fetch quite a large amount of data, 6,005 lines of data being returned. So obviously we want to limit the data that is being returned. So with GraphQL, we can actually apply what is called a filter. These filters help to narrow down our search and give us exactly what we need. In the case here, 
I have removed quite a lot of different data fields as we don't need all of the data. Just a quick flip back as well. So we can see that comparison. So we're looking for all of the continents, uh, pardon me, all of the countries within Africa. So making that request out, again, we're gonna receive back a much more trimmed down set of data with each country pertaining, uh, existing, pardon me, in Africa there. We've also specified the country code, what currencies they use, so on and so forth. And we can actually remove some of these other values if we don't see them or if we don't actually require them. So we can target exactly the elements of data that we need. As we get more granular, again, we can hit the country's endpoint. The country's endpoint will return quite a bit of information on particular countries. We can strip out some of these other values that aren't needed. And one more here. In sending that request out, again, we're about 3,200 lines of data being returned. We definitely don't need this much data. Maybe we need to target a particular country's set of data. So instead of reaching out and fetching every country, we can go ahead and filter down that list. Maybe we want only the countries that are on the continent of Europe. We also are gonna add a secondary filter here that's looking for the countries within Europe that use the Euro as their currency. We're selecting which data points we need. Maybe we don't need the capitals of every one of those uh, countries. Since we already are requesting Europe, uh, Euro as our currency, you know, I don't see the need for that particular element, but we can send that out now. We get back a much smaller set of data and we can feel confident that this data meets our requirements. The exact structure of the data is going to mirror the request structure that we sent out in the first place. So with maybe this bit of information, we can, we can leverage that accordingly. But as we continue down and get more granular in that hierarchy, we can specify a singular country. So we're gonna look up the country Luxembourg, And in this case, I don't need the continent field. We can take that out entirely. But before I do, actually, if we notice, again, within the country request, we can target the continent layer of that hierarchy. We can also target the countries within that continent and get back a full listing of the different countries. So we're still getting back a large set of data and we can begin to trim this out entirely. So we don't need languages. We may not need the countries. And we may not need to know the continent. So now we're left with a very specific set of data pertaining to the country of Luxembourg. So now as we are targeting singular requests, we can actually build functional tests within Ready API around the GraphQL uh, request itself. So we can go ahead and add this to a test case. I have a test case down below, so we'll go ahead and associate it there. And now we can expand our test case. The exact same query, we can send that out. We can also apply assertions. So we're validating response data as it is being returned from their endpoint. These are just a couple basic assertions, but we can obviously get very specific. Maybe we want to add in a validation for the city name, uh, pardon me, the, the country name. So we can actually do a JSON node expression, apply our string. This is just a static string for now, uh, but very much allows us to validate the data coming back to us. No need to manually review to ensure accuracy. Now, that's really why we have a tool at our fingertips to enable us to be a whole lot more efficient. So I'll close up our navigation panel here. Now let's walk through a quick scenario where we're gonna be fetching you know, 
X number of data points from our Java database. We're gonna inject those values into our request, send out those varying requests, all with the same structure, and then validate that that data is all accurate. So within Ready API, we can go ahead and append in an additional test step. As you can see here, we support many different protocols, not just GraphQL or REST, but we also have SOAP and JMS message queues like you know, AMQP. Some of the more cutting edge protocols like MQTT are included here as well. But for this scenario, we'll go ahead and add in a data source, drag and drop functionality just to reorder. And we'll also include a data source loop. One thing I personally include is always just a small delay. I, I think it helps to show the iteration that's taking place. And we'll go ahead and update that just to a half a second. So with these four components, we can now build out and configure them as we need. So we'll start with our data source loop. This will give us the iteration that we need to cycle through, fetch new values, and inject them. We'll then target our data source. Again, we have many options from which we can access data. Excel, files will read line by line, Java database connections, even Ready API's data generator. For this session, we will go ahead and connect to a locally hosted instance of Microsoft SQL Server. We're gonna target our country's database. Once we establish connection and we can see the connection string that we've made just behind the scenes, we also allow connections out to many other different types of databases. Just drop in the driver uh, and you'll be able to establish connection in the same way. But once we do this, Ready API displays a nice UI for us to interact with. We can target our country's table and then we have both a name as well as a code field within that table. So we'll go ahead and accept that prompt. Now we can also choose now to limit some of this data. So for today's session, I will just manually edit this SQL query, but I could also use the fetch size down below. And one additional benefit is the fact that we can execute stored procedures um, on top of that. So let's go ahead and run that request. And we can see our two columns of data. Let's jump back now to our test case, target our GraphQL query, and now we can update some of the data within this query. We, want, uh, we ultimately want this to be very dynamic in nature. So we're gonna go ahead and replace the country code LU. And with a right click, we can use get data. You also notice there's a code completion option that's gonna help benefit you as you are writing out these types of queries. Well, let's target our data source now. We'll target the country's code. And we can see this syntax included here. This again, in the same way we saw with Spotify and how we were chaining together those many different API calls. You know, this is how we can be very dynamic and access the data in the Java database. So all is set we can return back to our test case. And we're gonna see this iterate through about 10 different times. We're seeing some failures. So we can take a look at our transaction log and see exactly why those failures are occurring. In opening up the request response editor, we can see that we did get back a successful response. But when we look at our assertions, we can see that first off, the service was a little bit slower to respond, about 355 milliseconds out of 200, which is our set threshold. Most importantly though, we notice that our expected country value, uh, country name, pardon me, is still set to Luxembourg and our actual value is Afghanistan. So stepping back into our functional test, opening up our assertions panel down below, we can reconfigure our assertion to be as dynamic as the data in which we are injecting into our request. So we'll target that same data source. We can target the country's code here as well. So property expansion can really be used anywhere across the Ready API application. One other thing we may want to achieve here is to validate 
that the country name is accurate as well. So we can actually go ahead and add in an assertion for country name. We can use really any of the other assertion types available within Ready API. And we can also use the smart assertion tool, which is going to interrogate the responses being returned back, not only just the body, but the headers as well. And we can now begin applying assertions in bulk. So we'll activate for the country name field. We will replace Antigua and Barbuda, and we will right click use of get data, and we'll target the country's name. So now we have two different data validations taking place, referencing a third-party data repository. We can now save that and return back to execute things from the top. So one more time through, we should see a little bit more success on this as well, as long as our response time is not taking so long. Let's go ahead in. We did get back our response, but we can open this up. And it looks like maybe I've switched the fields. So we can update that accordingly so that our assertions are all in line. But for now, we can deactivate, run things from the top using just the smart assertion and hopefully see a little bit better behavior. But with GraphQL, we are able to target the exact requirements for our application. We do not need to overfetch data or underfetch data or make multiple round trips. We can do this all in one shot, which saves us a lot of time, a lot of processing power, and makes our applications a whole lot more efficient. 